What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Brown Girl Green Pod. I'm your host, Christy Drutman, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about the importance of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. I am so excited to be doing this at home IRL podcast with our guest today, and I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Alexa White. Um, I am the executive director of the Iowa Research Institute, as well as a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan uh, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Incredible. And so could you dive in a little bit on your background? Like, tell us more about, like, your journey. Like, why why did you study these things yeah. to that extent? To yeah. get to that level? Like, what made you passionate about it? A hundred percent. So I went to Howard University. Um, at the time, I was really not interested in academics. I wasn't really interested in much of anything. And I kind of followed my parents' pathway to becoming a doctor. Um, I said I was going to become a dermatologist, uh, but it was really hard for us to figure out what to get for school. And so uh, there was this National Science Foundation funded program where they were like, okay, if you go into the desert and collect these lizards, we'll pay you money to go to school. And I was like, okay, cool, let's go. I went, I loved it. Uh, they all were like, you should go to grad school. I went to grad school, and that was really how it all began. I always wanted to become a crocodile hunter, um, but it yeah. turned out that now I do people stuff and food stuff. Um, so when I got to, to Michigan for my PhD program, um, I worked in a coffee agroecology lab. And so there we were looking at uh, coffee tests and trying to understand the biological context of farming. And so I was all thought, and I was like, I don't really think that um, I'm getting as much from the lift as I am from the farmers. Um, and so I started to question that, and that became a whole dissertation my whole life. And it took me a while, but uh, I think I was primed to do it. Uh, so I come from a family of sharecroppers from Texas and North Carolina. And so oh. my grandfather, uh, who would take care of me after school and talk to me all about like planting me at gardens. And I think also a lot of things part of my life. I just hadn't really recognized it until I got to grad school. Wow, that's really cool. So it's kind of like in your DNA in a lot of ways. Yes, I'm sorry. That. That's really cool. So for people who don't know, could you define what agroecology is? Yeah, so uh, you could think of it as like a managed landscape versus a natural landscape. And so agroecology is looking at the interaction between the two and seeing how they can synergistically work together. Um, so, for example, when you think about like on TV, a farm with a barn and corn and that picture is not exactly uh, a good agroecological space. <laughs> uh, there should be a lot more diversity. Uh, the, the nature around it, the forest edge is really important. Um, agroecology means that you're working with the land, working with the space. You want pollinators to come, which means you want different kinds of things in the pollinate. Uh, you're paying attention to the soil, the incline of the land. Um, it's like a ranch is like not good. No, <laughs> not at all. So the diversity <laughs> is one, the livestock. And then usually the livestock is so concentrated in one area that it's getting rid of all of the vegetation that would have been there anyway. And as opposed to them sound like an open graze or like an agroforestry setup, um, maybe working within the trees and there'd be a lot of shade and different base blowing. Um, that's a simple story for me to explain it. But when you think of a, a farm on television, that is like the you should Google what agroecology is, and it generally looks like a forest, I would say. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people will always be like, oh, they like glorify this, like, cottage core or, like, farm lifestyle, but they're not necessarily thinking about, like, the ecosystem. That was yeah! Like, they're like, let me build a house? Yes! Let's land and live my little fairy life? But, yeah, it's more complicated than that when you're involved with, like, bigger ecosystem. But it is that way. You can make the cottage, though in tune with nature like it doesn't oh, yeah, yeah. have to be just like and if we are a bunch of land in the middle of the forest and then you're not engaged with the forest anymore right yeah. that, 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 that's really interesting and you know with like today's like industrial agricultural like you know space it just seems like there's less and less land to practice things like yeah have we call it yeah so a part of my research is really looking at who owns land and land tenure 
Um, a lot of the land specifically within the United States, obviously were on taken land from native indigenous populations. Um, and the way in which we have relationships with land is, is very kind of across the park, right? So, um, in order to own land, it takes a lot of bureaucracy. You usually have to go through the selling and owning process. Um, it's not easy and it's a uh, capital, uh, instead of considered um, a way to live, how you can like survive in here. Yeah. Wow, that's well. And, you know, a big part of thinking about agro ecology and stuff that you've also explored is this concept of like food sovereignty. I think going back to this whole like fantasy of like, okay, colonialism is like cottage off the grid, yeah. live off the land. There's, it seems like right now, like there is only a small percentage of people that can like actually maybe do that in a self esteem, right? It's actually a lot more, it seems like expensive yeah. to be able to do things like that. And in general, like, um, well, first, I'd love for you to define what food sovereignty is. But secondly, like, yeah, going back to this concept of, like, who owns mm -hmm. land, like, what are the connections between who owns land and, like, who gets access to food sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have completely, as an American society, outsourced all of our food. Everyone associates food with supermarkets as opposed to farmers. Mm -hmm. um, there are kind of really surface-level ways that you can engage, like uh, community, uh, search agriculture, a food co-op, and those are a little bit better. But even so, you don't have a real relationship with the farmer oh. um and so food sovereignty is basically saying that you should have you should be able to know where your food comes from who's creating your food and have a cultural relationship with it and the best way for me to describe it is compare it to our term food security mm -hmm. so food security means that you have food to eat it means you're not starving but my advisor uh, likes to uh, put it in context of like in prison so in prison you get three square meals a day um, there's some nutritional standard and there's a way for you to kind of continue living, mm -hmm. but we don't actually know where that food came from. It probably is a culturally relevant to you. You have no decision-making power over that. And, um, being able to, uh, be a food sovereign person means that, uh, you get to decide really, you have some sort of autonomy over your food. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when you go to the supermarket and you go get something that's packaged and you, it says like, oh, it came from Mexico. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are from Sovereign either. Um, how did it get there? Uh, an example I usually like to bring up is, um, so let's say we're in New York and uh, you go to the supermarket and you pick up a mango. It's January. How did that mango get to you in the middle of January? It had to be grown somewhere near the equator, probably, where it can just exist at all times. And then uh, who is growing it? The reason why it's so cheap here is because it's outsourced labor um, or honestly it's slave labor because they're not being paid the yeah, part. amount. Yeah. Um, then it has to get put into a truck usually, go through a bunch of roads to get to a plane, to get to New York, to stand in plastic and styrofoam in your supermarket, which then might go to waste because a lot of the food that we get here is to waste anyway. So it's like the entire food system, very fractured. It's very problematic and we interact with it all day, every day. So it's, it's a problem that we all interact with and just don't know how much of a change that we do. And I think it's also a part of, you know, cultural habits that yeah. we live in a society where people just, you know, want things when they want mm -hmm. things all the time year round. So, like, we've also, like, kind of been socialized to encourage a food system that isn't about seasonal buying, isn't about buying locally. It's about, like, I want the cheapest, easiest yeah. thing that probably contains lots of things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shouldn't be eating, like. Yes. But you don't have to talk to you. You don't really have the choice in that. Like, what? Yeah. This is your only option. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. The blended. Unless you pay a premium to get out of that system, right? Yeah, like, arrow. Whole Hollywood and all that kind of stuff. Like, four or five is idea. Right. Like, luxury food items when it's like, I don't know. My personal dream within this past year has been to put a lot more time and effort into things that I need to survive. So, for example, if we're not talking about food, a mattress, we sleep a third of our lives and we do not pay attention to what we're sleeping. We should probably pay attention to what we're eating in the same way. But yeah, you're right about seasonality and pay attention to what is geographically accurate. Um, tropical fruits and vegetables aren't meant to be there. And the reason why they got there uh, is because of a lot of colonial history and how there was a lot of uh, kind of discovered fruits, vegetables, items that they saw were growing 
John discovered. discovered. Stolen. And stolen. But M2. Who leaves uh, Bifra Clayton in the northern and southern hemisphere. Right. Um, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So in your research and, you know, the things you're passionate about, like, like, what are the solutions? Like, what exists to address yeah, that, yeah. that complex where you feel like you don't really have options? Yeah. So I think what's really important to think about is that we've dealt with hard things before. I am very much a proponent of um, kind of optimism when it comes to this stuff because everyone always wants to do it. And in writing my dissertation, which I did last week, actually. Slay. Yeah. <laughs> I realized that um, a lot of the, the theories around food sovereignty just go back to how we've always done it, right? And so it does for agriculture, corporate agriculture, it hasn't existed for that much uh, time compared to the amount of time humans have existed. Small-scale agriculture has been resilient through time. And so it's possible. It's just a question of if we want to change our structures. Um, the kind of surface way to change that would be to um, get a much more uh, intimate relationship with your food. So being really attentive about where your food comes from, how you are actually getting that food, and what food is local to your graphic and topographic area. So for example, around here, a lot of stone fruit is really popular, uh, berries, uh, apples, um, things like that are uh, really key to to this area, pumpkin. Um, and then uh, also paying attention to how we are individuals and putting the onus on the individual is not good because it, it's overwhelming. And I feel like that's where a lot of the pessimism comes in when it comes to climate and food. And a lot of that has to do with uh, us re we need to realize that we have to deal with this in a systemic way. The food system is global. The food system is interconnected. The food system is really controlled by a lot of agribusinesses and agrochemical companies. Um, and in order to uh, combat that in a capitalist society, we have to go through policy. You have to go through regulation. You have to go a lot of reform and revolution when we think about those things. So here in the United States, um, a bill that's really important for agriculture is the Farm Bill. It's an omnibus bill, just meaning that it could take a whole lot of stuff. Every four years, it needs to be redone. Um, and I don't think a lot of attention is put towards it, and it should be because there's a lot of lobbyists um, that are very, very, very um, adamant about it never changing to sway out. Culture. So is a farm bill like the bill that like it's running like how farms? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Is the farm bill about farms? No, but it is. So it, it subsidizes a lot of the a lot of the the farms that we get our food from okay. within the United States. And so a lot of my work has actually been done in Hawaii, mm -hmm. where they don't have a good relationship with. Uh, the subsidies that come from the farm bill because right. the United States and the United States generally the farm bill isn't um kind of geared to the things that come from Hawaii so they produce a lot of macadamia right. nuts and like specialty crops and pineapple and stuff like that and the farm bill really goes towards a lot of grains here crops and wheat you know how like the old food pyramid where yeah. at the bottom it's like grain that's incorrect first of all it's been redone recently but generally the idea that we should eat all of the cereal crops and a lot of green and carb came out of like the 60s and 70s post World War II during the Green Revolution. The world realized, oh my God, we have a problem. We have a burger cooking system and we need to produce enough food so that we can like survive these war times and this violence. And cereal crops does do that. So uh, we see a lot more bread. We see a lot of um, different kinds of cereals that are meant to kind of like keep us down late with that energetic caloric intake. Um, but you also think the injection of those things into the global south. So there's a lot of pressure for the global north to produce a lot more here, even though they had different kinds of diets. Um, they'd have to produce more in general. The yield of the crops needs to be much um, I'm getting off topic now. No, no, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, keep it's going. Not, no, I love it. It's not bad. Um, the, the back to the farm bill. So uh, the farm bill also came out around, uh, came about around that time. But it, it exists today uh, mainly to keep admitting dogs. So on top of the farm bill, it's SNAP benefits. So uh, food stamps and the way that people who are financially able to get food um, comes from the farm bill. So... When you hear about the farm bill, it's much more important than you think. Like, it has to deal with farmers getting subsidies. It has to deal with how um, corporate agribusinesses are kept in power. And it also has to deal with um, people who have much less political power being able to eat. 
Um, and so the way forward is to pay attention to it, understand there's a lot of lobbying around it, um, and uh, thinking about how we can change it over the next four years because it, and that's when it overlaps. So what are the opportunities with like the farm bill to address like what you're talking about, like small small farms? Yeah, so we generally have an opportunity every time the farm bill comes to um, attach different things to it. So it's in all those bills, there's a lot of bills that are attached to it. Um, in order to uh, change and get subsidies, you have to speak to your Congress people that are attached to each state. And they're the ones that allow it to get passed every year. Each it has a lot to do with the budget too. Every year during the fiscal turnover, um, the budget for the farm bill changes. And then specific demographics that get the subsidies are also skewed. So there's a whole entire literature about um, like chattel slavery and then thinking about, you know, sharecropping to and no more sharecropping, but they still have ownership of this land or ownership of this land. And that was all extracted over time right. over the, the 50s and the 60s um, because one uh, of this narrative that like you had to go north and you had to work in these factories and you had to be able to you know provide support you don't want to work on the farm you don't want to do that but uh, their realization that like land is capital like if you think about it when you get down to the core of what people need to survive Daddy, it's land. you need land yeah. you need land so that you can go shelter you need land so that you can go feed right. you need land so that you have runs to water Right. And um, in terms of the farm omnibus bill, it's it's truly about voting and politics. Um, it's also about political windows and paying attention to timing of uh, when the omnibus bill is about to come out. You usually don't hear about it on the news. Yeah, I, I yeah. never hear about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's huge. It's very important for us and um, farmers within the United States um, at, at an international level. Agriculture is a lot more of a bigger mess than it is in this, this structure. So you ought to have influence within the United States. I also don't know, like, oh, I'm sorry, it's something there. Uh, Americans are also international. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know a lot about the U.S. So, um, yeah, paying attention to when it comes out. It just came out a little less than a year ago. Usually it gets stalled, mainly because there's a lot of debate internally about where the subsidy should go and who should get SNAP benefits. Um, but those are the farm televised just because it's not, you know, funny. It's not real hot and nice and sexy to talk about. I get it. And literally is our survival. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So recently you received the Federation of American Scientists Policy Entrepreneurship Award in 2023 mm -hmm. for your incredible work with the IA Research Institute. And so I want to hear a little bit more on what IA is and the impact that you need with it. IA is an IA for research. Oh, I fell on. Yeah. So, so me and my best friend, Asia Peterkin, she's a, a PhD candidate at MIT. Um, we went to Harvard together, we were roommates, and we decided that we needed to create our own environmental justice organization. So I would say that we were mentored by Dr. Beverly Wright. She runs the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice when we were at Howard. And uh, she brought us to COP21 in Paris, and we saw it get signed and met Obama, and it was a fantastic situation where all of my friends at Howard were different scientists, and we all had a connecting piece to our lives, to our history, because it was the age of Howard was the HBCU. Um, and we were exposed to kind of how to operationalize a lot of the theory scientists often do. So when you think about a scientist, you usually think about like a typical man that's white with glasses and once in a lab. Um, obviously, we're combating that stereotype, but it's, it's also not someone that's good at communicating. It's not someone that you want to talk to. When you think of a man in science, it generally isn't someone that you think like will become president. And so at AYA, what we do is uh, we try and change that narrative. So the mission is to increase the amount of scientists and engineers of color that are involved in environmental justice research. So cool. Thank you. And so um, a lot of the, the projects that we work on are with different environmental justice organizations that need capacity building and support. Oftentimes the grassroots organizations don't have the ability to run a, a, some sort of soil testing or do some sort of experiment that would prove the points that they're trying to make through advocacy. Um, and so our goal is to to change that. So uh, I as a think tank where our, our framework is that we have a fellowship program with graduate students. They work with these organizations. They learn how to communicate. They learn how to engage with communities properly, not be extractive not just take this data and kind of put it into the side really like academic research uh you know make a difference actually do the things that they say that they want to do as opposed to you know being pulled away by private industry and mm -hmm. 
a lot more money than what you normally get paid as a, a nonprofit or, you know, doing the, the work for good. Um, and so a lot of things, a lot of the uh, work that we do at AYA led to my inspiration to work with FAS, the Federation of American Scientists. So uh, they had several different fellowship programs. Um, at the time, it was the pandemic. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew that I was interested in international food systems. I knew that I really liked talking to farmers. And I didn't know how to involve that. Um, I didn't know how to like, you know, have a conversation at a bar with someone about our research. And then I really wanted to do that. And I thought getting the policy would help me do that. So um, when I joined, I started thinking about environmental justice and tech and figuring out how to, how we're actually going to materialize environmental justice work. So um, I started to get really interested in environmental justice screening tools. And so these tools are now very popular for their application and policy. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what it is, it's just having geographic maps and being able to determine exactly where they are, where populations in need are. Mm -hmm. So there are federal level ones, state level ones, and then there's private ones and nonprofit ones. Um, Biden is doing some of the back end work with the uh, EJ screen, which came out of the EPA. Um, to better figure out how to handle the largest problem, which is kilos in the I'm not sure you know, too, it's a bad pass. Um, basically, if there are layers in a map that determine, oh, if you're here, the air quality is really bad, and on this level of the map, the, the soil is going to have a lot of metals in it, they don't understand how that individually will affect a person and their health. And then, so um, these tools right now are meant to kind of collaborate um, and they're supposed to use multiple tools in order to kind of narrow in on one specific question. Well, people don't know that. People don't know how to use them. No, um, no way. The ethics behind, <laughs> the ethics behind <laughs> the DJ screen. Yeah, it's it's bad. Bad. And I was like, it's not easy. No. Especially for a lay person. And it's like, you're supposed to, the people that will be, these one of the populations that come on in right. these places in the map to like if you're like dying like if you're struggling with like asthma yeah like blowing out all these things like your first thoughts have to be like let me go on this website and like understand the buttons right well we can have to figure out where to move like, right. you don't know how to use that yeah like where am i supposed to go yeah right. <laughs> and so uh I, mean, I saw that and that motivated me to kind of want to know about like the tech how it gets made um and then that led me down another rabbit hole of data ethics right so like when you think about where all of the data that's coming from for these tools is sourced it's census data census data is gappy census data is very unreliable right. and you think about like big data sources and it's not a really good uh, measure of need things and so a lot of the work that I was doing was one, to figure out cumulative impacts. A lot of people at Mount Berkeley actually at Region Row of Frost are doing a lot of good work for that. Uh, but also just be able to educate people on kind of what is this being used, what is new. It's come up within the past 10 years and it's going to be used in regulation that aren't necessary. People will take it as, you know, their Bible. We'll take it as like the absolute thing when some getting onto another rant. Science is political. Yeah. I try and make it very objective and that it is something and to calculate and it's always going to be probably not out of science science is used to benefit the population. That's yes. why the benefit from it. Yeah. I love you. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's all about, you know, this ivory tower kind of way of thinking, specifically yeah. academia, where it's like, I know about this in biology and chemistry, as opposed to like an application. And um, I feel as though data ethics has uh, the power to kind of combat that and just allowing people to even know what it will be used for is helpful because then they can protect themselves. <laughs> and a lot of politicians, you know, they don't want but they use it in order to make decisions right. and so just going back through that process of understanding where something came from um is really important to me and i think that it, people should just know that this is not being made for you and you need to you know you know what. it's either like you're gonna be 
deciding it or someone could be deciding it for you. Yeah. And for people just as a reiteration, that's the EJ or environmental justice screening tool. And people want to Google that and check, check that out later. Um, it is a really interesting tool. It's not the most user friendly, but it's getting there. And yeah. it's probably like the best we have in all terms of like community driven data. Oh, what's the um, was it well, that could be a word, yeah. So that was the work that I was doing. Um through that Aya and Maroon to be a lot of what it was today. Uh, I understood policy a lot better and a lot of that work kind of expanded into a vast number of different projects. Amazing. Obviously, you've given some like really interesting insights on things around the farm hill, but like, what are some other like policies or initiatives that you know, in your vision of actually building a more like just and sustainable future, needs to needs to move forward in this country today to actually make progress? Mm -hmm. I um just stepping back one more time to uh, the screening tools. Um, so a really big issue with it was that it didn't include race. And the distribution of race in this country. Um, I feel as though that was a damning fault, mainly because the entire premise of EJ in the United States is based on race. And if you're going to address EJ problem, you need to address race. That being said, when you think about policies and regulations, um, I think that uh, we always have to keep in mind the capacity and the bureaucracy of the government. Things will happen in time. Um, the speed at which they happen are uh, or is um, questionable, but we do so within political windows, right? And so um, the other policies that I think are really important are those that uh, are at the state level and surround culture. The regulatory bodies at a state by state level are really important for um, figuring out how to move away from industrial agriculture. And if we compare ourselves to Europe, the agrochemical businesses can run a muck here compared to what they can there. Um, the reason why uh, a lot of the uh, agrochemical businesses can do that is because we don't really identify specific chemicals that should and should not be used um, within the food system as much as uh, the EU does. Um, in terms of really specific policies, um, I'm more so in the camp of increasing the amount of uh, positions, kind of like legacy positions that are within the agricultural space to be stores for this kind of work. So um, I think that it's really, it was really a good thing for Detroit in particular to get uh, its own um, kind of agricultural stewardess. Uh, mm -hmm. So Tafira, she is a farmer from Detroit um, and has had that farm for a really long time, um, really good involved in the community, a native Detroiter, and now she is um, their sustainability rep specifically for urban farming in Detroit. I think that more positions like that need to come about. Um, people who actually know how to work the land need to be in power. A lot of indigenous kind of uh, environmental justice, not even just environmental justice, indigenous people in general, indigenous knowledge is key to understanding this land. Mm -hmm. It's literally indigenous land, and we keep kind of going in these circles of trying to understand what we could do to be more sustainable, and it was sustainable before we got here. Mm -hmm. we, we just have to kind of go back to what was. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my research in Hawaii had to do with um, figuring out how they could be uh, more self-sufficient in terms of an island. Um, so FYI, uh, Hawaii as an archipelago, as an island, if they're hit by a natural disaster, they only have enough food to survive for three days. They do not have more than that. If they're cut off from the rest of the world, there are no more imports. They have three days worth of food compared to the population. So the, the reason why what? I was doing my research was because the governor, Governor Green, wanted to make Hawaii much more self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about when uh, the indigenous Poly Polynesian folks got to the island, they had communities. They didn't have boats. But they had boats and, like, planes and stuff. They just wouldn't run the food there. And... <laughs> Adam Chemical Company, like, just had their a field day on the island of Hawaii, uh, experimenting and figuring out what chemicals they could, but basically it is their lab, or was their lab. And so there's a whole... They kind of destroyed everything by doing that. Oh, yeah, so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, narratives and stories about them being placed next to schools, schools with a lot of Hawaiian children, um, and... Uh, there are plenty of documentaries that go to uh, how these agrochemical companies basically just weren't regulated. And so there are places now that you just can't grow food, period, because that is where it was. And um, a lot of genetically modified crops that they experiment on there, um, they're... Okay, I must get really plant biology here. And so they, so like, let's say you have a place in Hawaii and you're trying to figure out what pesticides are or herbicides you want. 
So a lot of these pesticides and herbicides are actually bled into so that basically like a beetle or something won't want to eat it. Right. And they put on it. And a lot of the dispersion is through the air. And so although they might have like bond passes or regulatory body to have it contained in this one space, they don't ever talk about the air space. And so all of the pollination that's happening in this space and all of the, the all this just it goes anywhere it wants to. It's not just staying there and that that was not regulated then. <laughs> um I'm getting way out the running room which asked me. But basically uh Hawaii only has food for three days. Hawaii has food for three days. I really like paying attention to a lot of island ecosystems because they provide a really good model for being self-sufficient and, you know, paying attention to what you what? are growing on your land and eating what's culturally known. So in a way, like, do you think that there's like a new movement now, you know, we will go around the term regenerative, mm -hmm. right? Like, I have a new sustainable. Yes. A new, yes, and yes, yes. You know, like, and that's supposed to be this idea that, like, we're building systems that can last a long time. It's not just about sustaining resources, it's about regenerating it, so being able to create, you know, cycles of, like, more abundance of, like, things that, to, like, last longer and be self-sustaining, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, in a way, the way that you're describing it is like in your ideal world, like we we're building more systems where people feel the agency and the knowledge and like the leadership to be able to have, yeah, control over what they're putting in their bodies. A hundred percent. Yes. So that's from we think like this is it, it really is kind of infinite from the seed to you planting in that soil right, to right. to it growing a certain way to you harvesting it to you cooking it. Um, and so, yeah, so when I talk about food sovereignty and kind of like thinking about it in a context, it is multifaceted. It is extremely complex in terms of ways that you can participate. Yeah, so uh, I view that in three ways. One, just paying attention to your food and thinking about where it comes from, how you're located to it. Um, you need food to survive and you should really care about, you know, wanting to be, to be involved in that process. Two, do not pull all the blame on yourself. Um, be optimistic. You've done hard things before, specifically in the United States. We've got up in the civil rights movement. We figured out how to, you know, fly planes and make cars and do all kinds of crazy things. This is no different. And um, in doing that, we have to realize that this is a systematic problem. Um, you know, play and, you know, not wasting your food and all those things. Those are great and they are impactful. But what will be most impactful is addressing the system. In the United States, the way to address the system is to understand the farm omnibus bill and to uh, understand kind of where the these regulatory bodies are or having their way on your life and um and so um for you and i that's very easy you know we're here in in this in this place and we're successful and have have the knowledge and the know-how and the resources to kind of make that change but what we're doing and if i would assume you're listening to this podcast you have those resources too we have to fight for the people that cannot <laughs> for example mm -hmm. so uh, for those people that would never be able to, uh, you know, have time to listen to things like this or have an hour to be able to go to their, their states and then figure out exactly, you know, what the far on this bill is, mm -hmm. you're working for them to change the system that we exist with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you have any, like, books or resources that you recommend people check out to learn more about this? Yeah, 100%. So the work from um, Ashley Gripper, she is a professor at Tampa University. Uh, she works on a lot of um, Black urban agriculture uh, research. All of her stuff is great. Um, I really have had a lot of fun with understanding fiction and its blend with uh, agriculture. Uh, I'm sure you saw this brought this up before. Parable of Sour by Tia Butler. Afrofuturism is a perfect kind of like moral and ethical guide for um, thinking about this stuff. It's really big. It seems really cumbersome, but it's it's possible. Octavia Butler is one of my favorite authors. Um, and then uh, a lot of work by um, Rob Wallace. Mm -hmm. Rob Wallace is a guy who works in my lab. Um, this is a whole nother idea about industrial agriculture. But basically, he argues that um, the way that uh, agribusinesses are operating is going to produce, the claim produce more disease. Mm -hmm. So things like COVID-19, all of that stuff. 
all all the food that we eat generally comes from mammalian resources. They kind of been free of mm-hmm. these uh, probably what fridges of nature and, and farms. And when you place a lot, like let's say you go to a, a you place a lot of cows in one plate. They're all sitting in their all feces. They're all bunched together. That is a greening rub for disease mm-hmm. and just speed up the evolutionary process for right. viruses to hop over to humans. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah. It's cool. <laughs> Read his books. Those are the three people I like. And how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So um, my website, uh, alexawhite.co. Um, I post a lot of different um, things that I'm doing and ways to, to contact me. Um, all of my handles on all social media are Alexa B. Went. So Alexa, like, ends on Alexa. And then B is a boy. And then white, like the color. And yeah, the I Research Institute, the I Research Institute.org. Um, Those are all of me. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us and teaching us a little bit about agroecology and other interesting food system and what how we can start addressing in it and for people listening this was brown girl green where i interview environmental leaders and advocates about the importance of justice equity diversity and inclusion as well as creative solutions with climate crisis join us again for the next the next episode and in the meantime subscribe to the brown girl green podcast wherever you get your show and the brown girl green youtube channel and follow the new brown gold green podcast instagram at brown gold green podcast catch on the next episode